Henrik Chulu, writer and public speaker who lives and works in Copenhagen, Denmark, and who has been part of artistic and critical projects in Berlin, Barcelona, and New York City. In his work, he enjoys exploring the intersections where artistic creation, technological development, and political struggle flow together, often in the form of science fiction and often in collaboration with artists, activists, and academics. He has an academic background in philosophy and geography and had toured Europe as a musician before pursuing uh, freelance journalism and speaking career as a journalist and guest lecturer focused on infrastructural literacy, digital privacy, and security, as well as uh, the potential for political organizing in a digital world. He's deeply curious about how emerging technologies help social movements challenge established power structures by making new forms of organization possible, and in how new forms of power emerge and adapt to technological and social changes. I'm here to speak about some of the problems of artificial intelligence, some of the problems that it cannot solve. Um, that is stuff like income inequality, environmental degradation, surveillance and privacy risks, and discrimination on racial and gender lines. Um, and the reason why AI can't fundamentally solve these problems is that it's not a technological problem. They are political problems. Um, so they don't have technical fixes. It's problems that are inherent to capitalism, to, um, to uh, patriarchy, and to white supremacy. But what is technology? I think, so I, I originally I studied philosophy, and um, I have this idea that Douglas Adams famous British sci-fi writer. He's one of the brightest philosophers of the 20th century. And he has given us the best definition of technology. Basically, technology is stuff that doesn't quite work yet. And the good thing about this definition is that it gives us, uh, it distinguishes technology from things that actually just work, which we call infrastructure. Um, so for example, virtual reality, that's technology. Television networks, that's infrastructure. The blockchain, that's technology. Um, while the World Wide Web, that's infrastructure. And um, self-driving car technology, GPS infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So my gen the general theme of most everything that I do currently is about the power of technology, both how it has power over us, but also how we can take technology into our own hands and empower ourselves. Um, because for most people, technology is, is, is something we consume. We go on Facebook, we use Twitter, Instagram, and so on, and we live in basically someone else's world. Someone built that world for us. But as individuals, as communities, we can also actually take charge and build our own uh, tools, our own toys, um, and our own weapons for political struggle as well. And I think that's that's the key, um, the key issue today is whether we are living in someone else's technological world or building our own. Is that art? It can be art, and I think art is where it's it's uh, the easiest. It sounds challenging. <laughs> no, I think art is, art is the place where you can actually experiment. So, for example, one of the projects I was part of recently was um, during COVID, the, a lot of, of things couldn't take place, as we all know, couldn't take place physically that had to move online. And that meant that conferences, for example, became uh, Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. like just another Zoom meeting or an, an an online lecture. And what we did, I have this uh, group of people that I collaborate with in Copenhagen called uh, Cybernauten, the Cybernauts, it's like astronauts, but for cyberspace. And we, uh, we were tasked with facilitating a conference um, it online. And instead of having yet another online uh, video meeting, video conference, we decided to build this whole conference inside Minecraft. Wow, tell me more about it, I'm very curious. So it was basically inviting a lot of lawyers, cultural heritage researchers, 
artists into basically a virtual world where they could uh, collaborate on, on prototypes for ideas and, and further research. And because technology and, and, and politics, they're super intimately intertwined. Technology is already always shaped by state power, by corporate capital, and it's also shaped by the potential for civil society to organize and to resist. Whenever you program, every line of code you put into the program is actually a political decision you're making, because you're making decisions on behalf of the user. You're limiting what they can do and you're empowering, empowering them in other ways. Hacking is the opposite. That's breaking the boundaries, giving new powers to technologies by making them do things they weren't supposed to do. And AI is slightly different because it's not really about the code, it's about the data. Let's talk about more uh, how this AI is impacting uh, everybody. Uh, when I say everybody, I mean uh, whoever does whatever does, uh, AI is there to uh, either help or assist. How do you see this uh, new technology is merging so fast in, in uh, our daily lives? First of all, I, so I, 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 first of all, I think AI is a term that we've begun to use about something that is much less like if we take the term AI and just um, switch it out with the word statistics, then it makes a lot more sense because most of AI is just like really advanced statistics done very quickly on a mm -hmm. big amount of data. Um, and I think that's, that's the key is that we've actually always been doing this as, as civilized societies. Like we have some data, we have some numbers, we have some, let's say, street addresses or uh, in economics, some, some, some budgets and so on. So now we can just do calculations so much faster that we can do it at a scale where it all... It, 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 there's this saying from, I can't remember who, that uh, quantity has a quality of its own. And, and now we are, we're really seeing that with, with data. Um, and it impacts everything. And it's really the, compute, the amount of computing power, the amount of data that we have available. That changes a lot of things. Um, so you can see it on the, in, the, in the changes in the job markets, for example. And what seemed to happen, at least, is that um, new technologies, dest it destroys old jobs. <clears throat> Do you believe new, actually on that? Ob obviously, like there are jobs that don't exist yet. Like uh, uh, someone, who t there used to be a lot of people who took care of horses. Right? I can't, uh, well, sorry for interrupting yeah. you there. Uh, I, I think sometimes that uh, they, sort of assist more people in their jobs. No, but like, no, but... But, but you, you say that they're going to... They, there are jobs that will not exist in the future. Just like horse carriage repairmen don't exist after the car was invented. It's, but that's the thing, uh, new technologies destroy old jobs, but they also create new jobs. But the problem is it's usually in the middle of the job market that these jobs are destroyed, and the new jobs are created either at the low income level or the high income level. So you get this sort of gap in the middle. And the more this gap deepens, the harder it is for someone to traverse it. So there's a potential for this more, what you could call polarization of the job market. Whenever you have a, a radical new technology, like the steam engine, it changed the job market completely. Digitization in the 80s and 90s changed the job market, market completely. And now again, with algorithms, it's going to have impacts that are just as wide ranging. We know what happened, you just mentioned. So what do we do? We know there are boundaries and we, we can stop and we can drive. We know how to drive. So what do we do? What is that you think? Two things. First of all, people need, they need new skills. They need skills to navigate this new reality. So digital literacy, um, understanding how, how the technology actually works in practice. That's one part. The other part is organizing. The, the, for workers, they need unions, and unions need to change into this digital world because we see, uh, we see also this precarization, that, or what you call, uh, you call it like precarization, that, that more and more our work is not uh, for hire at a corporation for life, as it used to be for many people. You, you work, start, started working at, in your 20s, and then you, got, you, you went on pension when you turned, seven, uh, uh, when 65. You turned 65, right? 
um, and that was your life. Mm -hmm. For most people nowadays, that's not how the, the job market will be. It will be like half a, month, half a year here, three months there. At least that's how it's been for me most of my life. Okay. Uh, and more and more the jobs are going to be administered, administered or managed by uh, APIs, such as, uh, like for example, for Uber drivers. And, many other gig workers, you don't have middle management anymore. You have an, uh, an app that tells you where to go, what to do. If you're working in an Amazon warehouse, there's basically like a, a small box that tells you, okay, go to this shelf, pick up this thing, up then this go over and there. Yes. And, uh, and it's basically, you don't have a boss, you have an algorithm telling you where to go, what to do. And that means that you don't have a, a path from going from being a worker to being a manager to being the boss of the company. There's not that social mobility upwards. And that's a challenge. Capitalism has been destroying the planet, basically since it was invented. Um, and technology is, of course, a central factor in this. So data centers, for example, use a lot of energy to power the servers and a lot of energy to cool them down. And uh, before the pandemic, the energy or the carbon footprint of the data center industry, it was rivaling the aviation industry's carbon footprint. And now here, after the pandemic, it's probably higher. One strategy of mitigating this is, of course, using renewable energy, because you can't, you can't power a plane by you know, using a windmill, but you can power a data center by using a windmill. And you know they're rolling it out piece by piece, but uh, the problem is this only solves like a slice of the problem because data centers is only the safe middle of the digital uh, infrastructure. From the ex excavation of rare earths and lithium to the e-waste landfills, the, the data centers are just like this tiny slice. Um, but this is also a place where a little bit of work is being put into uh, to, to mitigate the physical uh, destruction of our environment by, for example, the EU has uh, been posing new rules about the right to repair and uh, product liability for people producing hardware. Um, but again, this is a systemic problem. It's not a technical one. We can't just fix it by building new technologies because the technologies are part of the problem. It's also not news that the digital world carries inherent privacy risks. It's sort of a backdrop of AI. It's, there's a massive amount of data that goes into these technologies. Um, in many cases, the data that is used to build and train AI is personal data. It's you and me, it's like our, our uh, um, behavior on Facebook and Instagram and so on. And since the Snowden revelation, since the Cambridge Analytica scandals, we've known that this is not, uh, not like a, a, a problem that we can't ignore. It's not a problem we can ignore. Um, and there are, of course, being taken steps to mitigate it, like the GDPR, for example, rules, and, and very hands-on stuff like privacy and security, awareness training, but it's actually quite hard. Like it's, it's, Privacy is a very difficult concept for a human being to understand in the digital world. We understand it physically, like we, we close the door before we go to the toilet, but what's the digital equivalent of that? Um, and also the cat is already out of the bag. The digital, uh, the, the personal data has already been leaked. The, your password is already out there. Um, so this, this is a problem we need to fix almost at the scale of the climate catastrophe. And where do, then there's the, the problem that uh, AI can get discriminatory. So because of all this data is taken from the societies we live in, if there are inequalities in the world that is represented, that gets represented in the data, and then if that data is used to train an AI, that AI inherits our biases. So the, 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 the key experience for me was that any, any technology will have what you call affordances and limits. Like it will limit you from doing certain things and it will make it easier for you to do certain other things. And for example, 
uh, the very basic ideas. For example, a car, when you get behind the wheel of a car, there are only so many things you can toggle in order to, sure. to drive. Like you can, you know, the stick and the, the pedals and the, and the steering wheel. And it, it limits what you can do with your body, but it actually gives you a lot of power in where you can go with your, like, in, in distance, for example. And I think, I think this is the same with most technologies. You get some powers, you limit some other powers. And where a Zoom meeting, it gives you a face and it gives you a voice. And that, that delimits us from you know, working with our hands, for example. And I think Minecraft gave, gave us that ability to, you know, like playing with Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. You can sort of build things together and you can see it from different angles and you can basically create something collaboratively that you can then walk around and, and talk about. And I think that, that's, that's an artistic project that I've been part of recently. The good meaning not that it's morally good, but that it's good at what it does. The bad meaning that it doesn't work well, but that, not that it's evil in any moral sense. And then the ugly, which is AI that is being proposed or used out in the world that is both uh, useless and harmful at the same time. Good, thing, good AI, that is automated perception. That's the overall uh, category. It's automated perception and automated uh, pattern generation. So for example, content identification. We use, if you use Shazam, for example, if you use Shazam to recognize a track, that is, it's very good at what it does. The same with facial recognition. Facial recognition is extremely precise. There are some problems, but it's very precise. There's medical diagnostics, what uh, Julia was talking about yesterday with, for example, using the voice. For example, today you can hear that I was at a party yesterday, and AI would be able to tell that much more uh, reliably than a human. But it's also text-to-speech, speech-to-text, and deep fakes, generating fake faces, for example. And, all, and that's why it's like good with an asterisk. It's not good in a moral sense, it's stuff that is good at what it does. It, facial recognition algorithms are really good at recognizing faces. Um, but they come, that and deep fakes and so on, they come with uh, uh, ethical concerns exactly because they are so accurate. Then you have the bad. And that is when you use AI to make value judgments. So, these are technologies that aren't perfect, but they are improving. So stuff like spam detection, detection of copyrighted materials, it's uh, automatic essay grading and uh, hate speech detection, content uh, recommendation engines like Spotify and YouTube and so on. It's not perfect, but it's getting better and better and better. And the ethical concerns here are more because of the inaccuracies. So there needs to be a human in the loop. There needs to be someone to check whether the algorithm has made the correct decision. So for example, very basically, sometimes you need to check your spam filter to see if that important email ended up there. Um, and then there's the ugly, and this is, this is where it gets hairy. It's uh, using, um, using AI or algorithms to predict whether someone will commit crime in the future. It's using algorithms to predict someone's job performance. Uh, let's go back to uh, what Do Dokotek is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been here for two days, and how do you like so far, and uh, how do you see uh, this uh, uh, happening? Well, first of all, this is my first time in Kosovo ever, and I've, I, I really love the, the vibe. The people are extremely friendly. The food is really good. Um, the weather has been okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I love that it's... It's, it's a space where people get to hear stories from the f like first hand from the people who are building this world that we're living in for good and, and bad basically. There's, there's, there's a lot of, of, of potential for people to, ex to talk to you know tech startup founders and activists and artists and so on. There's a lot of access that the people of, of uh, Kosovo have available so I think, I think that's a really neat. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, you said at the beginning, uh, you kind of warned us because we are all here to see, okay, what kind of uh, great uh, AI solutions we can see, etc. 
But you raised a lot of very, very important concerns, and I think this is, this is really important. So I wanted to turn back to you. I know we talked, so I'm using an opportunity because we did chat about this uh, a little bit before, and you said, I didn't offer many solutions because I wanted people to come up with solutions, but what is one, one thing that is coming to your mind as a potentially the most important as a possible solution? So the, the very first step, the lowest hanging fruit in all of this is transparency. And it's not enough. Transparency is not enough. We need what we need it. It's sort of the, 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 the baseline for even beginning to tackle these problems is getting insight into how these algorithmic decision-making systems come to their decisions. And this is a problem for a lot of different reasons. One of them is uh, many governments are not interested in transparency. Many uh, companies are not interested in transparency, but there, there are different reasons. Um, one of them is trademark laws that don't allow us to sort of get access to how a specific algorithm works. Um, but there is a really, really good paper by, uh, I can't remember, yeah, Ellen Goodman and Robert Browneyes, I think, from 2017, I think. And it's, it's, it's basically it's outlining eight criteria for what is necessary to actually have uh, algorithmic transparency. Like, if, so if, if I apply for something in the public, uh, in the public sector, and I, so for example, like a grant or getting a driver's license or whatever, and I get a rejection, I have a right to know what basis that administrative decision is made on. That's like my legal right because we have rule of law, due process, all that stuff. But when it's an alg algorithm that makes that decision, for, for in a lot of ways, there's, I have no way of looking in and getting the, the answer. So in they, I'm not going to outline the eight criteria, but it's a really good paper. It's, it's basically, we need to know what data has it been trained on. What data was excluded from the training? How has it been validated? How, uh, what was this algorithm actually designed for in the first place? Because usually these, these algorithms aren't designed for what they do. So for example, um, one predictive policing algorithm is designed to predict earthquakes. And then you use that algorithm to predict crime. Um, uh, another thing is what, uh, what uh, what one very basic thing is, okay, as you need to explain to me as a human being, how does your algorithm work? And if you can't explain this, I need to know that, right? So there's a lot of different criteria that you can sort of check off and say like, okay, now we have transparency, but that's just one step. Then you need accountability. Then you need to sort of be able to, to go in and challenge the decisions that are made by algorithms and so on. Um, so that would be my sh shortish answer for that question. Question. Make a comment on the, uh, discrimination and bias on the algorithm in the fact that uh, in Kosovo we face a lot based on the technology as well. I can take an example because I am part of this regional cooperation or network and it's always, I can see how discriminated we are, not just other things in Kosovo but also by te uh, technology because for some cases uh, some apps don't uh, allows to use them completely and we always have. My question is like how do we advocate for that and uh, how we, if you have any tips in general, how we can mask, because I think there was a lot of a, a petition and this kind of movement to recognize Kosovo in many maps and this kind of stuff, because still we have problem with that, but that's my answer as well. If any tips will be useful, thank you. I, I, I basically, what I want to do here is just drop a name in, call someone into the room, a good friend of mine called Gillian York, and she's someone who does a lot of what is called platform advocacy. Basically, like if I want to change something about like how the government does a certain thing, I would adv advocate to the government. But some of the work that she does, and a lot of other people, not just her, she's just like a friend of mine. So uh, that is advocating in say Facebook or Google and basically going and say like, you have this problem, this is a place where you violate human rights or where you discriminate against, you know, uh, against race or LG LGBTQ people or whatever. And documenting the, the discrimination, going to the platform saying like, this is what's happening, you need to fix it. Otherwise you are sort of, you have a, 
identity problem or like a communication problem. That's one way of doing it. I'm so not saying it's the only way, but something that certain people like Gillian from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and other people are, are doing this work. So I think that's, that's one way to do it. How would you address uh, young students, young people? Uh, uh, what would you say to them uh, regarding the, the, the education and focus on technology and what technology is bringing? I think the how would you sorry how would you prepare them to for the market? I would say learn some skills like learn some digital tech skills, but I don't think that's the most important thing because that's that's something you can you you will always have to learn new skills. There will always be some new new device or some new. Uh, new technological uh, way of doing things that that they will have to sort of uh, approach and learn but I think actually try to figure out how this affects you politically how to this affects you economically in the job market I think that is something that is a key skill to understand the the context, the social context of technology, because that if you only focus on the tech, on the machines and the code and so on, then you actually lose the perspective of what it does to the world. Henry, thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you.